Welcome everybody to the Smooth Brain Society. Uh, I am Sahir. With me today is Professor Alberto Costi and my co-host Jeremy Hall. Uh, I will let Jeremy introduce himself in a bit and then we will talk about Professor Alberto Costi's work, but I'll get I needed to get through a few things about this episode before we get started. So uh, today we're going to be talking about, in, we're, going to be, we're going to go through a little bit of an introduction into international law and um, international law of armed conflict. Uh, and we're recording this on the 26th of March here in the UK and 27th of March in New Zealand. Um, and so therefore, what recently happened in terms of the news is just yesterday, this, the, what do you say, the United Nations Security Council passed, uh, finally passed a resolution on a sort of ceasefire deal uh, for the next couple of weeks while from the month of Ramzan is happening. And by the time this episode comes out, we would have been one week through it. So uh, this is not completely up to date with those details, but I thought I'd give you an idea of when we're recording it because some of the examples which will be brought up in this discussion might be relevant. Um, another thing which we also might talk about is because this podcast episode is about international law and armed conflict, we might talk about Russia and Ukraine, we might talk about some of the laws around genocide, so keep that in mind. I think an important thing to keep in mind is we're talking about international law. And so please appreciate the fact that sometimes the the law on its own might not lead to the results one would wish. And please appreciate that fact when we're discussing this. And yeah, I think those were the key things which I wanted to point out, some of the examples which we go through and all that. So yeah, with that, let's get to the actual episode. I'll first introduce... I'll first let Jeremy um, introduce himself. So you all might know him by with the shirt which I'm wearing or the logo of uh, the Smooth Brain Society. He's the one who's designed it. So I'll let Jeremy talk a little bit more about his work. So go ahead, bro. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm a Kiwi director and producer working in uh, London in the advertising scene. Um, and Sahir and I have known each other for for quite some time yeah. and uh i saw the initial smooth brain society graphics and decided that they needed an update really quickly uh, he couldn't be friends with a creative and have non non-good uh <laughs> logo design <laughs> um and yeah and we're keen learner and, and interested in in these kinds of things so very very happy to be here man thanks great great to finally have you on i've been trying to get you on for a bit to be fair all right uh so the, I guess the star of the show, the person we really need to talk to today, Professor Alberto Costi. Um, he is a professor in law at Victoria University of Wellington. There's, he's part of a lot of things, so I'm just going to read out some of them. So he, so he specializes in the law of armed conflict, international criminal law, international humanitarian rights law, the law of international organizations and international environmental law and in comparative law and European Union law. So he has published extensively in all these areas and just some of, some of the things which he is a part of, he is a member of, he is a member of the New Zealand International Humanita Humanitarian Law Committee and serves as Secretary General of the International Law Association New Zealand branch and the, he is the Vice President of the New Zealand Association for Comparative Law. Uh, so welcome, Professor Costi. Thank you for coming on. Thank you very much, uh, Sahir. It's a real pleasure to be with you and Jeremy today to discuss uh, some very interesting issues, well, sadly, very interesting and very topical issues on, on international law. So I'm, I'm really happy that to have this opportunity. So thank you very much for welcoming me on, the, me on this podcast. Thank you. Uh, so should we start there? Like you said, topical. We hear it a lot in the news that international law, this someone's violating international law, someone, something's happening. But what is it? What What is international law? Is it this kind of constitution the world has agreed on or are they different documents? How does it actually work? If you could give us an idea, because I feel not many people actually know. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sayer, for this opportunity, because the problem with 
international law at the moment because of the sad events that are occurring all over the place, not only what we see in the media, in Ukraine, in Gaza, but there are conflicts in Africa, in, in Asia. And, uh, and I'm really sorry to start with that there's some noise because it's very windy in Wellington. Wellington is a very windy city. And I can see from my window the, the, the rough seas as well, which I think uh, encapsulate quite well the state of international relations today. So international law uh, or public international law is at its origin, the, the rules of law that govern the relations between states, especially in the older days, it was really states were the only subjects of international law, those that had the capacity to enter into treaties, the capacity to enter into diplomatic relations with other states. And what we've seen, especially when after the Second World War, has been the increasing role of international organizations. They were by no means not existing before, but with the creation of the United Nations, we had a great hope that it will allow the international community to work much better by, re by regulating the relations between states, also looking a bit more at uh, the other legal persons. And, I'm, I'm, and what we've seen after the Second World War is the creation or uh, the emergence, rather, of other, uh, other uh, actors, such as international governmental organizations that can enter into treaties, that can have missions like the United Nations sends agents and boys, as we call them, to different countries when there is a crisis. Uh, some of the auditors might have seen uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations going to the border of Gaza uh, in, in, in Rafa. To, so as the Secretary General, he embodies the organization that has a huge role. Uh, and also more and more with the development of human rights law, we've seen that individuals have started to have rights and obligations in international law. You mentioned uh, armed conflicts. Well, obviously, when we look at armed conflicts, individuals who are not taking part in hostilities should be protected. They should not be targeted. At the same time, if someone takes up arms or someone commits acts of genocide, uh, crimes against humanity, they can be prosecuted. So what we've seen, the development of international law starting as a body of rules governing relations between states, little by little has increased its presence by have also governing relations between states and international organizations, and more recently in time, also relations between states and individuals and legal persons well, when I say persons, it's legal person, could be sometimes in some areas corporations, but mostly we're talking about physical persons, you and me, and we do have rights. The, the, so international law works generally well. That's uh, partly probably how we are able to speak to each other at this moment, you on the other side of the world. Uh, it's possible to travel because of existing treaties between states. Uh, com commerce also works with the World Trade Organizations, uh, free trade agreements, and international law. One of the ba one of the main sources are treaties, uh, where states and sometimes international organizations come together and they negotiate the text of a treaty. For instance, the Geneva Conventions that are talked about in the in the, in both cases of Gaza and Ukraine that where states agreed to set out on paper rules that govern uh, hostilities. At the same time, international law, especially in the old days and still today prevalent, are rules of customary international law, that is, rules that are not in writing, but that are based on practice, consistent and uniform practice, which states follow as a, because they have a feeling that they have a legal obligation to do so. So these are the two main sources of international law. Uh, and generally, states do comply with, this, with, with uh, these rules. But as we see in the case of some of these conflicts, if we say, and even sometimes in terms of uh, trade agreements, that there are sometimes uh, conflicts, there are sometimes disputes. And that's where, unfortunately, a lot of the attention goes. And that's why international law is sometimes perceived as not working, even though most of the time it works. Unfortunately, 
when it doesn't work, it can lead to incredible, tragic consequences. And Ukraine, Gaza, we can talk about Central African Republic in the last few years, Mali, with the destruction of artifacts, uh, rigid artifacts. We, we, we can talk about so many conflicts. And I think it's the role for, for media and role for interesting and incredibly important podcasts as yours that we talk about international law, what works, but also what doesn't work and why sometimes it doesn't work. It might not well might, might not be that states want to violate international law, but I think international law and international relations go very well together because sometimes it's a question of vital interests. When a state believes their vital interests are at stake, they will sometimes set aside those rules. And that and that can make for us, members of the public, a very frustrated breed of people. I'm not sure if that covers a little bit uh, the general rules of international law. Uh, hopefully, it gives it gives a, it gives a general idea at the moment. No, I think it gives a pretty yeah pretty good idea of what to expect. Um, in light in I guess in light of you saying that we don't really focus on the positive things as much, we we can start there. I think it's a, it might be a good idea to just give us some kind of positive examples of how international law works or successful cases of it and then we yes i know we will delve into other things (laughs) later (laughs) yes well uh, examples uh, i can see in the in the case of uh, uh, free trade agreements even though obviously they do come with a baggage and they're not all positive but that sometimes allows products from one country to to cross borders to another country and that allows for uh, lower tariffs in trade and therefore uh, lesser cost in terms of uh, of uh, uh, consumer prices. At the same time, uh, areas where sometimes it works could be also in terms of aviation law. The fact that uh, tomorrow I'm taking a flight over to to the United States to Washington. Well, this is made possible in part because of agreements that exist that allow civil aviation to work with with airlines being able to cross. The, the airspace of other states because there is an agreement that allows that to happen without seeking uh, permission all of the time, uh, as long as they stand as planes fly within some corridors. I can think about international environmental law. Again, it can be sometimes slightly contentious. We know that. But if we look at uh, protection of some uh, uh, species that in re- at risk of extinction, we've got... We've got uh, CITES, it was a convention of the 1970s that has done a lot to try and limit trade in endangered species. Uh, I take also the example of human rights, even though there are still a lot of human rights, the presence of uh, human rights treaties to which most states have become parties, they've signed up to these treaties, means that often our domestic laws take into account uh, human rights uh, protection for us individuals. We still have to comply with the law of the state we are in, but at the same time, if uh, you're imprisoned and there's no trial, you're just sentenced to to jail. Once uh, all, all recourses at the domestic level are completed, well, you can petition to a, sometimes a human rights committee at the at the United Nations or if someone is in Europe at the European Conven- a Court of Human Rights. What I mean is that there are the states do not live in a vacuum where they can do what they want. They have obligations that they have, compl- they have accepted to comply with, whether it is purely a kind of an exercise in, in, in uh, public relations to be able to say we are party to a treaty, or because they fundamentally believe uh, I do like to think that the Geneva Conventions, despite the violations that we see in some of the current conflicts, states sat together and accepted that they needed to set out rules that govern conflicts. It, it does not eliminate the law farm conflict or international humanitarian law does not eliminate conflicts, but at least it's attempting to humanize a little bit more what happens during an armed conflict. And you know, Sahir, I would say that when we look at international law, and as I tell my students when I teach, we have to look at international law 
at, at now we look at it as a discipline, as a, almost as a language, because in diplomatic circles, states don't have to say much and other states will know what they are meaning. But international law, more than simply a legal discipline, it's simply also a discipline of how to conduct relations in society. But what we have in the 21st century is, is the product of many centuries and, and millennia of relations. We can go back to, uh, to the, to the 2,000, 3,000 years before the common era, and you had already some treaties, in, not maybe in the modern sense, but treaties between the, the pharaoh of Egypt and the Hittites in ancient civilization in the Middle East. Uh, the, so there was this idea that that sometimes monarchs or I mean rulers would get together. Well, what has evolved over time is that it's gone from I would say almost uh, punctual examples here and there to more and more a set of common values where you found the same idea of rulers entering to agreements in Asia, in ancient Asia. You found that you found that in in, in Europe, in the Middle East, and Little by little, I, these common values kind of crystallize into a language, a common language. And I think the best example is that of the law farm conflict. The, we, we find in both in, in the Christian tradition, the Jewish tradition, the, the, the Muslim tradition, similar principles that you should not target women, you should not tar target the elderly, you should not set on fire uh, trees that produce fruit. During an armed conflict, there you find similar ideas of limiting the use of force during an armed conflict, and this goes from tra traditions or of or, or or records of those historians at the time to you see towards the 19th century more and more rules that come into the first Geneva Convention in 19, in 1864. You see that in the development of the body of law from conflict in the late 19th century. And in the 20th century, where we have, have we've been able to negotiate important treaties on the on uh, limiting the use and, and prohibiting the use of uh, personnel landmines, for instance, and in the 21st century, even the use of cluster munitions. I like to say that I like to think that international law, because otherwise we would be very frustrated if we think it can work in a go. It's really the product of an evolution. And it goes through some difficult times, and sometimes it's through those crises that something comes out that betters society. Like the United Nations is really the product of the failure of the League of Nations after the First World War. The fact that that the states started, took very much the law into their their hands in the between 1920s and 1940s, and then we had the the Second World War. And that was followed by the creation of the United Nations. So I think really we, we have to look at these on incremental changes in society and the protection of human rights in 2024. Not perfect, I admit. I'm first one to admit it. But the protection of human rights around the world is, is much better than it was 50 years ago, 70 years ago. And I don't even want to think about going back centuries, how individuals were treated. It's really interesting that you you bring up this as kind of an evolutionary trait, because um, I, I guess I often find that humans from all over disagree on quite a lot of things. But it's it's nice that we've I guess agreed on this set of rules to to abide by, especially in armed conflicts. How often do we find examples of international law sort of being broken? And in those cases, what are the penalties? Like who is holding these states and countries accountable and how? Yeah, yeah very, very good question, Jeremy, because yes, it's all very nice to have these principles of international law that we should all live by, all nations in harmony should live by. The reality is that they are broken. And the question, how do we remedy broken rules? How do we ensure that the state has been responsible for breaking a rule somehow has to in international law we say that a breach of an international law obligation entails state responsibility in the best in a nutshell in the best of circumstances we could turn back the clock 
and a state that, for instance, has refused to extradite someone to a, to a state that requested such an extradition, well, turning back the clock is that they will surrender, surrender the person. Uh, uh, but what happens often sometimes is that there's no other way than to go to a, an international tribunal. And that's the difficulty is that there are many more breaches of international law than there are way that there are uh, instances where states will be brought or will take another state to an, an international tribunal. So international law, what has also uh, Im improved over time is that there are mechanisms out there when states breach international law. Some involve a, either a judicial process, like bringing another state to the International Court of Justice. It can be when individuals have committed war crimes or crimes against humanity or genocide could be prosecuted before the International Criminal Court. Uh, there are tribunals which are based on arbitration where the parties will accept to go before a third party who will arbitrate the, the, the decide between the claims on investment uh, disputes, for instance. Someone was invested in a country and somehow the investment is taken over by the government. They sh they, there are such tribunals. So that, that's one way is that uh, states have accepted to uh, appear before a tribunal. Uh, that's probably only a minority of situations. Often, these breaches will entail a response at the diplomatic level. So, for instance, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, and Trade in New Zealand, let's say a foreign warship enters enters uh, the, the, the territorial sea without permission and or has a kind of a hostile intent. Well, New Zealand could also not uh, could protest to the other to the state of the of the of the flag of the ship of that ship uh, these these situations are i think the majority of cases where at a diplomatic level the ministries of foreign affairs will correspond will discuss and what is interesting in terms of international law is the that the response of a state that feels is an inter, international has been breached serve sometimes to build the practice if you have states that that do not accept practice by other by another state on a subject it can build that practice of so states that means that a practice is not acceptable at the, in, in, in the international community the other possibility is that uh, the matter is uh, discussed uh, before a the, the forum of a, an international organization like the general assembly where often a state will raise the matter, and this, this General Assembly has sometimes taken, uh, has passed resolutions condemning the attitude or asking states to comply with international law. This obviously General Assembly resolution. I need to tell to tell, tell us tell you that they are not binding on states, but they can have. I think it can be used as a means of pressuring other states not to not to violate international law. And then for those who are members of the United Nations, obviously the Security Council has a quasi-executive function, but it's not really the right term that, to use, that uh, sometimes disputes can be taken by, this, by states, by member states of the United Nations. Matters can be raised by the Secretary General at the, at the Security Council. A member of the Security Council can bring uh, the situation before the Council and theoretically, the Security Council could pass a resolution either, and in, in that could involve, if it is passed under Chapter 7, you might hear in the news often they say this resolution has been passed under Chapter 7. It's when the Security Council has decided that the situation threatens international peace and security. And then measures can be taken. It can be diplomatic sanctions, economic sanction, and in rare cases, it can amount also to the authorization for United Nations members to use force. What the Security Council usually uses as a formula, all necessary means to restore peace and security. Now, before, I'm going to even preempt your, probably one of the questions you could come up with, which is the Security Council, well, it doesn't work well, and you're right, because Chapter 7 is when state member, some uh, five members, 
permanent members of the Security Council can block a resolution project. And we've seen the last few weeks when uh, when uh, China and Russia were not happy with the text of the resolution asking for ceasefire in Gaza, well, they vetoed it. So the problem is that there's kind of a, I would say, a double veto that these permanent members, which are the United States of America, United Kingdom, France, the, Pop the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation, that they can decide that the situation does not threaten peace and security. And therefore, in that case, uh, there's the, the matter will not be taken up at the, uh, under Chapter 7. But even if it does, if the, there is a decision, there is a, th a threat to peace and security, the resolution, if it calls for sanctions or calls for for uh, for use of force or even call for a ceasefire can be vetoed by by the permanent members and as you've seen in this resolution that was passed yesterday or it was that the, the united states did not veto they abstained so one of the, the those five permanent members in the 15 member security council can decide to just not take part in the vote they, they abstain and in that case there is no veto and that's why the resolution was passed, but the resolution does not imply that there will be sanctions, there will be intervention. Uh, it only aims, I think, to point out the problem that is that is existing at the moment. Now, that's good that you preempted the question because what I was thinking was along those lines, there's still some things which I'm interested in knowing there. Um, so yeah, you did mention that earlier in the week, Russia and China vetoed the, the this Israel, uh, Israel Hamas conflict ceasefire for particular reasons. Before that, the UK and the US were also vetoing yeah. earlier resolutions yeah. for yeah, exactly. other reasons. And I know Russia kept vetoing things with regards to U the Ukraine conflict. So. One, there seems to be a real conflict of interest here when certain, yes. especially the ones with veto power can say things. I'm sure China would have done it in their benefit. I'm sure the U.S. might have done it with regards to Iraq and Afghanistan yeah. before. Um, so I have two questions. One is, is there ways to get around this or is this just a inherent flaw? And the second thing is, how did all these link with the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice, because they seem like both big events. But as we know, there's cases going on against, well, I can talk about three different genocide cases. One is by the Gambia versus Myanmar. The other one is Ukraine versus Russia. And the third one is Israel-Palestine. Hmm. Oh, South Africa-Palestine, technically. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how do these kind of link up to each other and yeah. Yeah. the inherent flaws with it? Yes, well, uh, on, on the latter point, uh, the reality is that so international law is based on the consent of states. That consent, they express it through entering into treaties, entering, uh, accepting to follow rules of unwritten law that they feel they have to follow. And what the rule of consent means, first of all, that a state cannot be forced to appear before a court unless they have consented to it. So that's why uh, there are few cases before the International Court of Justice, because for that to happen, there must be evidence that the state has consented to it. Now, in the recent times, you mentioned those three cases on genocide, but in reality, the International Court of Justice has become a popular forum again to try and resolve disputes because some of these treaties do have the, the, as me, the means of mechanism to settle dispute recourse to the International Court of Justice. So in the case of Gambia, that some people might wonder how a state based in, in Africa, what is its interest in what's happening in Myanmar? Uh, that, and also you could ask, why is South Africa taking an action against Israel? The reality is that these states have all become parties. So they signed up, they've accepted to be bound by the Genocide Convention. 
The Convention on Genocide that was adopted in 1948, obviously in the aftermath of the atrocities of the Second World War, does provide as a mechanism in case of dispute in case of states wanting interpretation of the of the genocide convention, uh, that they they if they have a difference of views, that is a legal dispute that crystallizes in legal dispute. The means by which they've accepted to resolve these disputes is to go before the International Court of Justice, and that is why these states have taken other states that are parties to the treaty before the court. Now the the interesting element in here is that genocide is considered along with torture uh, the crime of aggression they are con- and, and probably slavery as well that among, uh, they are considered to be obligations so important that all states have an interest in making sure that there's no torture there's no genocide and so the, there is kind of, you know, uh, we call, because, you know, in international law, we like to be pedantic, so we use a lot of Latin expressions. One of them is what we call use cogens or cogens, which are peremptory, obligatory norms of international law that we make that fiction that all states accept must not arrive, must not occur. And genocide is such an important uh, principle not to commit genocide. And therefore, these states, even if there's probably no Gambian that has been subjected to genocide, to alleged genocide by Myanmar forces, uh, because there is an obligation uh, for all states to ensure there is no genocide occurring, Gambia has been given the capacity to bring the case before against Myanmar, because the court, International Court of Justice can look at those cases is an obligation between the parties to the treaty and that's the same mechanism with with uh, south africa and israel and ukraine and the russian federation so there is that possibility but again it takes the consent of the state to be able to appear before the international court of justice in the case of the international criminal court it's based again on states becoming parties to the Rome Statute that was adopted in 1998 that set up this inter- uh, this international court. This one is an international criminal court, and this one, th- th- this this uh, uh, court prosecutes individuals, not states, but individuals who have committed crimes that fall within that the, between the this Rome Statute, which are. Uh, crimes, uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and since only a couple of a few years ago, the crime of aggression. We'll come back to the crime of aggression in a few second, in a few minutes. But the crime, war crimes, crimes against humanity, can be prosecuted, but it has to occur within the territory of a state that has signed up to the Rome Statute, or its nationals have committed such crimes. Now, the big question is in, uh, concerning Russia. And you, you, you have heard that some, that, uh, some uh, charges have been brought against President Putin and against the child, Children's Commissioner. Because even though... So Russia is not a party to, to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. However, the Ukraine has signed a declaration of acceptance of the competence of the court in relations to war crimes. And that's on that basis that the International Criminal Court, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, has laid charges against President Putin and the Children's Commission, which I forget her name at the moment. But these have, uh, these have, there's been enough evidence gathered by the team of prosecutors of the International Criminal Court that they are confident that there is a case for Putin and uh, to respond before the court. Obviously, uh, President Putin is not going to travel to The Hague uh, out of his own accord. And so it means that these charges are out there. But theoretically, all p- parties to the Rome Statute, all states that are parties to the Rome Statute, if Mr. Putin happens to l- land in one of those territories, Theoretically, their obligation would be to surrender him to The Hague. 
to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. I don't think that will happen, but that's in, in theory. The problem, the, the, the reason for which, so, so you have this, then there is a crime of aggression. The problem there is that Russia not being a party to the Rome Statute, not having accepted the competence of the, of the, of the, of the court, uh, the crime of aggression cannot be prosecuted. Putin cannot, charges cannot be laid against President Putin on the basis of a, crime, of a war of aggression that is obviously started against, against Ukraine. I know I'm a bit technical and probably a bit complicated, but really the, the idea is really that that in terms of uh, of bringing a case, Moscow. I mean, what, uh, the Russian Federation is not a signatory to the Rome Statute, and because of that, the court cannot exercise its jurisdiction over the crime of aggression when committed by that state's national or or, or on its territory. It, the only possibility would be to have the Security Council pass a resolution, but we know that Russia will veto it. So, so that, that's, that, that's the question. Then, even if there is competence for the court, the question is always one, uh, if, what is the evidence brought by the parties before the court? It's not a, the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, it is a question of uh, uh, beyond reasonable doubt, like you would find in most domestic courts in terms of criminal trials. The International Court of Justice, it's preponderance of evidence. Having When the, the court believes that the state has produced evidence and, and that the rules have been broken or not by the other state. But the case of Ukraine, I want just to mention that what they've done very, very cleverly has been that it's the Russian Federation that was accusing uh, the Ukraine of having committed genocide, actually, of committing or planning to commit genocide. And so what uh, the, what Ukraine did was to bring the case before the court because Russia has accepted the jurisdiction of the court, and Ukraine says, well, we want the court to say wh whether there have been acts of the genocide. And obviously Ukraine says, no, they have not committed genocide. So, so But we will see what will happen once the, the case is heard by the court. And obviously many of these cases go before the International Court of Justice and take a long time before a decision is taken. And because you go to a third party, you can never be sure you're going to win the case if you're a state. So you have to think carefully whether to bring a case or not. As for individuals, uh, well, there's certainly many more war crimes committed than there are individuals prosecuted before the International Criminal Court. And because there's been so few, and most of those have been who have been charged, have been prosecuted, or are being prosecuted, have often been from the African continent, which has led to some calls for condemning the court for bias against against uh, against African states. So that is that's what the prose possible prosecution of uh, President Putin is a welcome sight to see that the court is not only aiming at looking at what's happening on the African continent. But it is these, both, all these mechanisms, all these tools of resolving disputes, unfortunately, they tend to be very politicized. It's interesting you, you sort of say there are obviously some biases that have been pointed out. And in cases of the UN, and when we're talking about sort of votes on or against genocide people are able to veto this do we find in international law that there are some countries that come out better than others it sounds like some some of these countries for example the russian federation is able to just sort of veto allegations against themselves is it sort of a system that's rigged <laughs> like what's well, what's the deal there yes i, th I think to, to come back maybe it, it was a question sayer was asking or refer or hinting at earlier as well is that how do we change the current paradigm of international law? Well, the, the UN Charter, the Charter of the United Nations, which has all these powers of, of the UN and its agencies, is not perfect. But amendments, you can amend a treaty. But So you could try and, and ensure that we get rid of the right of veto of those five permanent members at the Security Council. 
But for that to happen, they must also agree with it. The, princip- the, the mechanisms of amendment of the Charter of the United Nations is not the best way to go. And also p- partly because when the, char- when the United Nations were created, the idea was that it, we would not have wars anymore. We, that states would work well, that we, the, and the United Nations would look into the causes of these problems. Have it, so that's why you've got uh, agencies and organs that look more into social and economic conditions. Uh, there's been creation even of the of environmental agencies, uh, re- protection of refugees. The, the idea at the end of the Second World War was that we were creating a new order and that we would these the for instance chapter seven that provides a possibility for members to use force in certain limited cases was going to be really the exception because we would not have wars anymore and in fact so we can say that uh, according to the charter well there's no more uh, wars they are not fought there are armed conflicts and in fact but then and, and theoretically that that should not occur the reality is quite different and yes the five permanent members and sometimes some of their allies or their or like-minded states come out well because measures are not taken because of the mechanism that exists. The only way to change it is either to continue reforming the UN. Reforms have occurred over time, but the Security Council, I know many of my students are, are hopeful, but I think certainly not in my lifetime, and I'm afraid even in their lifetime that will change. The other possibility, but then it's a it's a greater risk. Well, I have a new paradigm. Get rid of the charter and all states sit down and try to organize the future uh, legal order. But the problem is that it's sometimes better to try and improve a, a, a framework that might not be perfect, but works to some extent, than trying to start from scratch. So this is really the, the, the great uh, problem about uh, reforming the United Nations. And re- some, some reforms can work because all states have an interest. Getting rid of the right of veto for those five permanent members of the Security Council is not going to come easy. And, and, and then the, the question you're asking, Jeremy, which is also very important, is that we do have states that believe strongly in, the, in a rules-based order. That's one of the formulas that is used often even by New Zealand. You know, the New Zealand, that uh, there's always the stereotypes that we like to punch above our weight. But in reality, New Zealand is, with other countries like Canada and, and many other states, are kind of middle power. They do not necessarily come across as hostile, even to states with which they don't maintain very good relations. But these are states uh, that do really believe that the best way for world relations, for international relations to work, is that we have a system based on respect for some rules, a rules-based order. And that's very often the intervention that the middle powers like New Zealand will, their intervention before international uh, forums, it's really along those lines. And I think for states that are not superpowers, that don't have major military or economic power, that is really what they need to work and lobby at at international organization. How to ensure that everyone might not always be happy with all the rules, that we we make changes, we work, and we try to comply with those rules as much as that is possible. I know this is hopeful thinking. You're, you're going to think I'm a high on something at the moment, but no, no, I'm. I've only had coffee this morning, and it. But it is. It is. It is. Uh, I think totally right. And and students uh, are sometimes quite pessimistic because they see this and 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 what happens. And when you look at the news, blogs, it it is uh, at the moment especially difficult. But the international community has gone through difficult times. I'm uh, old enough to have lived and having been at. I was uh, thinking. Early high school or late elementary, when when the Cold War was in, well, I remember in the early '80s, we thought a nuclear war was going to happen. Uh, we were able to avert it, uh, 
I like to think that we're not going to see it now. But yeah, the, it's it's a difficult time, and and for countries like New Zealand, this, they have to work with other like-minded states, and what that's what they do, working with like-minded middle and small uh, middle power small states to work together to at least try to balance power by 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 number, if not by military and economic power. That was really good. I've got so many questions. Uh, I think the one, I think the one which I'm gonna ask first is, you mentioned, well, we spoke about bias in the ICC in terms of mainly Af uh, people from Africa being brought in front of it, um, and you also said that uh, Russia not being a signatory of does not help in the in the cases, although Putin is, well, there, there's an attempt to bring Vladimir Putin forward to the ICC. What happens for sort of non-state actors? So example, the Taliban, um, well, now they're technically a state actor considering they're the government of Afghanistan, but before that, same thing with ISIS, same thing with, yeah, if someone from, let's say, Russia's Wagner group com committed war crimes, how would... How do sort of non-state actors who did not technically buy, sign on to any of these things, where do they come under international law? Excellent question, Zaire, because if you remember at the beginning, I talked about how international law started from governing relations between states, more and more governing relations that included international organizations, but also individuals and, and non-state actors, non-state uh, groups. And... The, that, that means that we not only as individuals, as non-state actors, not only do we have some rights in international law, but we are also under obligations in international law. As individuals, we, can, we should not be committing crime, war crimes. We should not be committing crimes against humanity. We should not be uh, taking part in genocide. And there are a lot of these treaties in international law, these principles of customary international law, that they are binding on everyone so if we take uh, groups that we could we would put under the chapeau of ter terrorist groups for instance uh, you know i'm aware that someone calls terrorists someone calls freedom fighter we're not going to i'm not going to get into this sensitive issue but as individuals we cannot i mean mo most states are parties to uh, uh, con uh, conventions against terrorism so when you commit a crime like a terrorist crime, well, you, you should, each state, when they become parties to a treaty on, against terrorism, undertake to pass legislation at the domestic level that will, in fact, condemn such practice. So, in, in the, so individuals, as individuals, uh, the members of ISIS, members of, the, the, of other terrorist groups could be prosecuted wherever they can be found. And if they commit crimes that fall under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, and that, and they are either nationals of a state that is a party to the Rome Statute, or they they con they they commit those crimes within the territory of a state party to the Rome to the International Criminal Court, well, then they can be prosecuted at the domestic level, and in some cases could even appear before an international tribunal. Now, there in international law, even though we have these groups, and and even already in the Cold War, you had those uh, the the groups working for self determination, uh, resistance groups, uh, freedom groups, they 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 are not properly actors as groups in international law. However. They, uh, they do influence the evolution and development of international law. That's why states enter into treaties to condemn terrorism based on the actions that they've co committed. So, so th th that is certainly one, one element. The other element is that obviously, well, the Taliban being also, in fact, govern the, the government of, of uh, Afghanistan at the moment, they've become kind of the... the they are the government in place, but if then they were, let's say, a, an opposition movement conducting uh, conducting conflict in, in in Afghanistan, well, then again, they are the non-state groups, non-state actors are also bound by the principles of international humanitarian law. 
and principles that are important that everyone, whether it's the state's uh, forces, whether it's individuals taking part in a, in a, in a, in, in a group, uh, armed group, that you cannot target civilians unless civilians have taken up arms against you. They, they have to discriminate the, among targets. If, there is, if uh, the target is close to a civil object or a, civil, or a civilian, they, well, you have to think twice whether you're going to, to, to use force or not. You should not undertake a military operation if the incidental or collateral damage is so great that actually they should not have undertaken such action. So individuals, part of, the, of non-state actors, do nevertheless have obligations under international law. And when they are captured, as some members of ISIS have been captured, some members uh, of, uh, of the Russian-related uh, forces in eastern Ukraine have been captured when they've sometimes tried to escape to Western Europe. There's a case, I, there's been cases, for instance, also taken against individuals of committed crimes in Syria, uh, I think there's been a case in in Germany. There's been there's other cases going on in Europe. So these individuals commit crimes that are considered so important, and 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 that all states have and should have an obligation to try to do their best to bring them to justice. That even if the, the crime has not been committed on the territory of the state, the state might have the jurisdiction to prosecute the individuals. So no, no state groups are not, uh, or and individuals, we are not immune from prosecution for some violations of international law we, we undertake or we are complicit with. That's really interesting because, what was it? Um, I, I've, coming back to the kind of bias thing and the the thing which you said you wouldn't touch the f one person's freedom fighters and another person's terrorists mm. you you can see how certain i feel like african nations mm. the most probably but then for example in bangladesh in 1971 yeah. when the crimes were committed by pakistan against bangladeshi people and they were funded and helped by the U supported by the united states and richard yeah. nixon mm. people can be like they committed it this happened certain presidents of or the mm -hmm. USA in this mm -hmm. case got away with it. I'm sure Stalin and Mao and all got away with mm -hmm. a lot. Um, again, it comes to the bias of none of them ever being prosecuted. Yeah, they say it's easy with hindsight uh, to see. Uh, you're, you're all too, too young, but uh, the, the Khmer Rouge in the late 70s, when uh, we were well aware in Western societies that the Khmer Rouge were conducting a genocide in 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 uh, Cambodia, and and the the I can see the comrade number one Pol Pot was responsible, and we had that. Yet it took a number of years before that the government of the Khmer Rouge was really condemned internationally. When, uh, when uh, so in, you know, between 75 and 79, I think it was probably more than a quarter of the population that was decimated. And when Vietnam forces entered Cambodia, well, they were condemned by, in, in many circles. It is true that their intervention was partly because Cambodia had conducted some operations within Vietnam. But that it shows, yes, that, that sometimes at the time, uh, another example, we were talking about freedom uh, or freedom fighter versus uh, terrorist. Uh, again, many of your listeners are probably too young, but do you remember, but uh, Yasser Arafat, Yasser Arafat was uh, the leader of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, was considered in many states, especially in newly independent states after decolonization, was considered as a hero. And obviously, in many Western countries, for a long time, he was considered as a terrorist. So yes, it, it, there is a, a political. And then also, as we were already saying earlier, it's the fact that sometimes, well, states don't want to condemn the action or exactions of some of their, what they consider allies in a region. And, and that can lead to such... Uh, 
incredible results. Unfortunately, politicians don't always think about the long-term consequences. And I would say, Sayer, I'm not an expert in dispute resolution, but something certainly I learned, even I remember as a, as a young law student, was that even the way of you how you resolve disputes, there's a very different approach in many Western societies as opposed to, to societies in Asia and Africa. Sometimes in the Western societies, I'm, I'm generalizing here, it's a very caricatural, but sometimes there is the idea that, well, there is a, a breach of international law, you respond in that way, or if you have to protect your allies at any cost. There's not always this idea of sitting down and seeing how to best resolve disputes with the long-term vision. And I think that in terms of dispute resolution in, in traditional societies in, in Africa, in, in Asia, there's, they are much better at that than Western societies. And Western societies, then, then sometimes Western governments tend to have a very short-sighted vision. They think that they should protect this or that regime and, and at almost any cost. And that then leads to, obviously, a backlash. Uh, so so that, that is really... And obviously, politics comes in the way. Uh, often and even to this day. I think the, the big difference, though, between my young days during the Cold War, which was very much bipolar between East and West, and you have also you had that North-South divide, but many of these states in the, in, in the what is all, nowadays we often call it the Global South, w- w- were really, really in, in early stages of development, but really it was bipolar. What we see now is that it's a multi-polarized world. If you look at uh, at even vetoes, the vetoes on Gaza that that uh, China and Russia have, have passed. If you look as well at the reaction to the sanctions taken by some Western states against Russia, as compared to the way Russia is still doing business with the other with other countries, I think with India and and even. And so what what I, I say what I say as a difficulty for international law is the fact that these alliances are no more straightforward. They they are very much based sometimes on subject matter, and that, that's and and the question is as well that as I, I come back to the point I was making before, bringing a state before a court or a tribunal, it's a lot of costs, and and not only economic costs. That's only it's long. In, the process can be long and drawn out quite a lot, but then it's also what does it say about the future of relations between those states? No, uh, no, that makes it another one which mentioned. I know it's not nearly in the same league, but Nelson Mandela was uh, labeled a terrorist for ages, yeah, even yeah. post. Presidency, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's certainly the best example. He went from being considered in in some circles, he he was considered as a hero, someone who was put in jail because he was a threat to an oppressive regime. In other circles, he was considered as a terrorist. And by by the early 1990s, he, he was freed and then became president of South Africa. And uh, and so yes, yeah, it it is quite interesting. All these. Uh, contradictions that the system, that the international system has. Uh, should we now talk about uh, the actual laws around armed conflict? I know you mentioned the Gen- Geneva Convention, yeah. Um, yeah. but I remember you saying the 1800s. So is, has this been a moving document? Because you also then mentioned that we, we have the genocide laws from 1948. So could you give us a background into specifically armed conflict and we can spend yeah. the rest Oh, yes. Final so, half so, hour yeah, on yeah. that. So the law of armed conflict is the appellation, the older expression is used often in, in military circles or, uh, or traditional laws, uh, laws of war, law of armed conflict. And it is very much today considered the same as international humanitarian law, which will be much more used by the International Committee of the Red Cross, by uh, non-government, non-governmental organizations that deal with <clears throat> looking after people who are victims uh, of uh, during armed conflict, so the, the the body of law that is law from country is is, a, is it's a specialized body of international law. It's a, and it governs. There are nowadays kind of it has been since a, since the twentieth century kind of two main areas. 
One looks very much at uh, the force and means and methods that states and some non-state actors can use during an armed conflict. And another body of rules looks more at the treatment of those who are no more taking part in armed conflict or are not taking part in armed conflict. We're talking about uh, fighters and soldiers that have been injured, have been captured, and civilians who are not taking part in uh, in an armed conflict. So the the I would say the older rules delay related to means and methods of warfare. For instance, means is the kind of weapons. Already by 1868, we were trying to ban or states, not in a treaty, but in a declaration at a conference in St. Petersburg, took the position that some projectiles should not be used because they they really uh, generated a unnecessary suffering. And we're talking 1868. And 1864 was also the fact that that the first Geneva Convention. So the Geneva Conventions have increased with time, but in 1864, imagine we're talking a long time ago, a number of states sat down and agreed to the rules that should happen when when sol- a soldier is injured, uh, out to, that uh, some t- medical teams should be able to go out on the battlefield and they should be able to care for the injured soldier, whatever the nationality, and they should not be targeted. Uh, so you have the, these already in the 1860s. And in fact, when I was saying earlier about common values that crystallize into, into I would say, more moral rules and then into legal rules, around that time that we have the Geneva Convention in 1864, where we have the civil war in the United States between the forces of the Union, the Union forces and the Confederates. And a professor of law at Columbia, Francis Lieber, came up with a code of conduct for the armed forces of the Union, the North Force, Northern forces, that what they should and shouldn't do during warfare. And you have even in New Zealand, there is uh, the, the, often we use an example uh, before a fight, uh, before a battle between British forces and uh, Maori uh, iwi or tribes in, in, at Gate Pa in the Bay of Plenty in the northern part of the North Island, where the, 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 the Maori warrior chiefs decided to set a number of rules what, they would, what would happen if, they, if a soldier, a British soldier, doesn't have a weapon anymore. What if they take refuge in the church? What how to treat women who are taken, who, who are uh, captured? Do you have already, so you have on three different continents similar kind of willingness to limit using the use of methods of doing warfare. And for me, it's it's beautiful because it shows, you know, in those days uh, there was no internet, and there was, and still, and on different continents you have, so, and you can you find similar ideas in in ancient China, uh, especially the, the the teaching of Sun Tzu, a, a philosopher, uh, many many centuries ago. You find in in traditions in 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 ancient India. So you have these rules. And by the 19th century, even though there will be other incredible conflicts, but you see that evolution and the body of rules of law from country or international humanitarian law really finds its roots in these movements. There's, and, and by the 20th century, we have a number of treaties that will be signed. We have treaties that ban the use of biological weapons, chemical weapons. Now we have cluster munitions are banned, certain types of personnel landmines. You have, we, and the Geneva Conventions have also increased by by we have the in the when you look at the fourth Geneva Convention of 1949, you have a convention that deals with soldiers are, who are no more taking part in armed conflict because they've been uh, injured. Uh, you have uh, similar rules that apply to warfare on 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 the sea. You've got a convention we often refer to prisoners of war, the POW convention. What happens when someone is captured? They should not be just shot. They should be provided with shelter. They can they they should not be allowed to go back and take up weapons, but they should be treated 
normally. And and then you've got the convention that deals more with civilians. And the fact that it's, it's at civilians, yes, uh, during an armed conflict, if uh, the forces of occupation can subject the local population to some restrictions, but there is a limit to it. You cannot just put in jail all those you perceive to be uh, enemies of the uh, of the concurring forces. There's so the Geneva Conventions have grown, and then by 1977, maybe some of your listeners will, will know that we 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 have ad- added two additional protocols in, in, in 1977 that are in fact one is on international armed conflict, so when it's forces of two states fighting each other, and the, the 1977 pro- first or ad- first additional protocol brings together some principles that deal with how, how to deal with the people involved in, in, in warfare, but also the type of weapons, targeting methods, like discrimination of targets between, between military targets and, and civilian objects. And then we had a second additional protocol, slightly more contentious, that deals with internal armed conflict, non-international armed conflict, when it's forces of the state versus a, 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 an insurgent group or fight between two insurgent groups. And in 2005, a third additional protocol was signed, which was because obviously the Red Crescent Society and, and, the, in, and the Red Cross Society they were perceived in the Red Cross as having some religious connotation. And a third emblem that provide immunity, a third flag, that with, with a red diamond, which was in, in fact because of, uh, based on some, on some uh, campaign by Israel. To, uh, so we have additional protocols. So as you can see, there is, an, and if I, if I come, come back to weapons, in 2017, there was the adoption uh, of, by a number of states of the convention banning the use of nuclear weapons. What we see is, is that Armed conflict does not mean that there's no law governing the situation. In the old Roman days, one of the one of uh, writer and philosopher of, of Roman times, Cicero, said that in war the law falls silent. That's not the case. In war, human rights still apply. A law of armed conflict does apply, and the. The, the the problem, however, is that yes, these violations occur, and very few people are brought before tribunals. And that is really the the question. But also, these rules. There are many of these rules, and and I think that we, we without being contentious, because I think it's quite well recorded by accounts from the Red Cross governments. The reality is that both in Ukraine and in uh, Gaza, there have been most likely war crimes committed. When I talk about war crimes, we're talking about th- that military commanders have to decide when you have a target close to a hospital or close to a school, what is the best way of achieving the military objective? Well, sometimes it might well be, well, you'll have to wait. Sometimes you might have to take a decision. It's not a, a, a completely proportional analysis, but yes, do you, what kind what kind of weapons are you going to use? Are you going to, to if you have a what you believe is the military base or a, a compound of the enemy forces, which are within thirty meters from a school where five days a week you've got young people, young, young children there? How do you? attain your military objective. You're entitled to complete your military objective, but it's you don't have a free hand on doing what you want. And I think that, and, and so maybe at some point, yes, you want to limit your losses, but sending a bomber with a, a, a huge bomb or missile that is going to create incredible loss of wa- life casualties, Destruction. Well, then you should think twice. So military commanders have an obligation. They are well advised in general by legal advisors and other advisors, and they take that decision on the basis of the information they have. So that's what that. Is. So in the case of Gaza or Ukraine, it is possible that sometimes some bombings that create casualties 
might have been based on the fact that the information available at the time meant that the, this, the measure taken might have been proportional, might have been the, the, what would have limited the casualties. But then on the ground, it's all based on how much information and verifiable information you have. What is also another possible viola discussion that's been about uh, violations of the law farm conflict. Uh, there was a few months ago a dam in eastern Ukraine that was bombed <coughs> by Russian forces, and that created environmental catastrophe, flooding uh, in, 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 some, in some place in eastern Ukraine. And there were a few commentators who said that this was a war crime. Again, again, we have to be careful in the case of, uh, of that dam. It, it, it is possible that it was a war crime, but dams are not protected, are not immune from attacks. The, what the additional protocol one of the Geneva Convention says is that there, it's, they shouldn't, uh, nuclear plants, the dams, dikes should not be targeted unless there is an imperative necessity to do so. So there's a margin of maneuver. I think the problem really sometimes when we look at it as members of the public, there are losses of life, of infrastructure that make no sense, but we have still to look at it through the lenses of, of uh, uh, the law farm conflict. It's like claims of uh, genocide. That's again, first of all, claim, genocide is very high threshold to say that someone had the intent to destroy a whole uh, part or a whole group. Uh, and it, it is, it, and I think that many listeners will, uh, I mean, totally, truly, and genuinely believe uh, a genocide is taking, has taken place or is taking place in either in Gaza or in Eastern Ukraine. It, but we have to look at it through the lenses of the law uh, to avoid also that the, the law be, that situation becomes a free for all. And uh, I would probably say that in the case of Gaza, despite some the atrocities, some atrocities do amount to war crimes. I, if I put on my hat as a law professor, I would probably say that there's not the intent on the part of Israeli authorities to destroy the Palestinians. And I would tend to think that, certainly from an international criminal law viewpoint, I don't think at this stage that I have in front of me enough evidence to say that genocide is occurring. I know this would be contentious with some of your listeners, but there certainly are war crimes when, when uh, some some uh, targets uh, make little sense in terms of what they've achieved, and also the presence of uh, of displaced persons. The, what, the, for but for law farm country, the same thing in Ukraine. We have to look at evidence we have. I would I would be happy to change my position if I had more information that would lead me. In fact, international. Criminal law and international criminal court can only work on the basis of evidence. It's like any court of law, and uh, and there must be a ready to bring from a charge to be taken to pre-trial to be able to be then bring it to trial. There must be evidence of, of that that there is enough to at least bring the situation to trial. So it's not it's not a beyond reasonable doubt, but it must be a preponderance of evidence that, yes, the case should proceed. Wow, quite a lot in that. <laughs> What's the, um, you have quite an optimistic view of uh, this armed conflict, international law in general, which I think is quite sweet. I like the, uh, the sort of idea that there are communities globally that can agree on these rules that sort of mean we have to treat each other as human but then obviously there's there's exceptions and we're sort of talking about um the the sort of events happening in in gaza at the moment who who sort of decides and what is the threshold 
for genocide, for example, right? Like, where, when is the point? Is, is it, and what is the evidence? Do we have to see a bunch of atrocities sort of happen in order to pull somebody up on this? Um, where do you sort of draw the line of intent? I think that's really quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for uh, the epithet suite, because usually my students think that I'm quite cynical. I was certainly born on the cynical side of town, but I try to see that, 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 that I try to balance what, what, what's happening with, with the legal rules we have. I think all this shows how the law is sometimes inadequate and, and is often trying to, to, to run after events rather than preempt them. And I, I, think, I think you're right. From, from, from the point of view of processes, as I said, it's very much based on the capacity to bring a case before a, a, an international or a domestic court. So most states do have legislation in place, like New Zealand does, the United Kingdom does, that if crimes of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity have been perpetrated, even outside jurisdiction of the state, they might sometimes be prosecuted. Now, the question is that the best way of prosecuting someone who has committed such crimes is in the place, in the state where this has happened, in the sense that the evidence is there, uh, witnesses are there. The problem, though, is that sometimes the infrastructure has been completely wiped out. So the, for me, the best solution is a local solution. Sometimes it cannot work, and that's why you've got sometimes the international, the international criminal court, because the international criminal court is really based that on the idea that states who are willing and able to prosecute individuals who have committed such crimes should proceed with, with the prosecution. The court will only kicks kick in if i may say once it's clear that either a, a member state is unable or unwilling to prosecute now this is not done just automatically generally it's the office of the prosecutor that individuals will send evidence groups like for, like for instance i know of some uh, groups of uh, young jurists who and or young law students who <clears throat> have sent information to the office of the prosecutor that there should be some prosecution of, I don't know, for instance, directors of uh, oil companies because of climate change. So the, the process is really done through the office of the prosecutor. Theoretically, the Security Council could also ask the, the court to deal with cases, but because of the right of veto is very unlikely. But then the office of the prosecutor really has to come you know, bring together evidence. Uh, do they have witnesses, testimonies? And then it's a bench of judges that will decide. And at the International Criminal Court, it's based on the idea someone will have to be uh, con convicted only if there is evidence beyond, proof beyond reasonable doubt. Now, how does this proof come from? It's really part of, mainly from that evidence and unfortunately, some, some who have not been uh, convicted or on appeal have been freed. Uh, there's a number of people, a number of, of uh, individuals in, in Democratic Republic of the Congo was mainly because the evidence is not clear enough or witnesses do not want to appear before the court. The fact that it is in The Hague, far away, makes it more complicated sometimes. And then the other solution, though, is that if these individuals who might have perpetrated such crimes are found in the jurisdiction of another state, they could be prosecuted before domestic courts. New Zealand, for instance, and I, I think our legislation uh, is very much based on the, on the law in the United Kingdom, may, allows, even if someone has committed a war crime or genocide outside New Zealand, the, the courts could still issue an arrest warrant if the person comes within New Zealand. However, for when the conduct has not taken place in New Zealand but elsewhere overseas, it takes the consent or it takes the, the agreement of the attorney general before the, the, for the case to proceed. 
If not, well, then the court will not entertain the case. Now, in terms of every, of a burden of proof or intent, apart from being that it is beyond reasonable doubt, well, for each for each crime, there are elements that need to be fulfilled. The For the International Criminal Court, there is a publication that elaborates on all the elements of crime. So it's not based pure the evidence, but that it needs to fill in to, to fill some categories. For genocide, it is probably one of the most difficult ones because there must be an intent to destroy partially or in total a group. And that's a very high threshold. And and that the the, the that makes it quite difficult for an internet for a criminal trial. Now the case before the court at the International Court of Justice, which is a state versus state case between South Africa and Israel, I think what what South Africa is is pleading is that Article One of the Genocide Convention has been violated. Uh, with insight, I think that the better way for South Africa to have taken the case before the court would not have been under the idea that. Israel has committed genocide, but maybe rather to look at the other obligation of the Genocide Convention, which is that states must not indulge in, in, in or allow genocide to take place. So there's a variety, I mean, there's a variety of subtleties in the process. For me, the best way, and I know I'm probably sounding overly optimistic, is to make sure that through the International Committee of the Red Cross, through NGOs, through uh, hopefully young generations, we can work towards what New Zealand calls a rules-based order, where respect for rules that exist, m- mitigating the number of occasions where these crimes do occur. But at the same time, I think that uh, that we, we have to accept that prosecution under in, in law subjects the situation to a very sometimes formal. Uh, formal uh, re- restrictions and requirements, and that's and if, for instance, there was a case in the before the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, where I think that the what led to the acquittal of an individual, I think on appeal, was that I think the the prosecution's basis was that the weapon used, which was some kind of rocket launcher, was not precise enough, and the commander knew. But I think that they misled the court on the um, <clears throat> the precision or the the margin of error of the weapon, and based on that, there was enough. It, 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 the court decided to to acquit the individual. So it's it's it is it's what makes it quite quite uh, frustrating. And I, and I would really say that even though we we like to think we should go to the court, we should bring cases to the international court, international criminal court, but certainly in terms of uh, of uh, reality is that these cases take a long time. And when you go before a third party to decide, like in the court, you can never be sure what will happen. And so sometimes it might be better to try and prosecute within your own borders. And in other cases than, than, than war crimes or labor, you try maybe to at the diplomatic level to sort out differences. Like for instance, even when you look at the the case of these ceasefire resolutions, including some of them that have been vetoed, probably if the P five would have met a bit more and would not be in a situation of hostility as the, some of them are at the moment, maybe we, we could have avoided the circus of having in the same week a resolution <laughs> vetoed and then a resolution with when one of the members you can see pictures sits down not doing anything because it is simply abstaining so I, th- I think that it is it is uh, the problem with international law it's it's the the it, it is really the, the enforcement and uh, the efforts can be made at implementing it and making sure that the interna- domestic law take into account the international law that co- courts uh, governments take into account inter- their international the international obligation of their states but at the same time it's it's uh, it, it's a victim of the same problems that all domestic legal systems have. If I take, the, I always use a very silly example for my students, but in New Zealand, the the crimes the crimes the, uh, the crimes act does say that uh, you cannot commit murder. Yet we do have 
dozens of murders every year. And in the UK, it's the same thing. It doesn't mean that the system is corrupt, that the system is bad. It, it, so there are, I think the, the difference with international law is that it can lead to incredible consequences. And I have to say that in my lifetime, this is the f- second time only where I can feel that I, even though they, I, I, I like to think there won't be a, a nuclear war, but it wouldn't take much for, for a leader to decide to press the button, certainly more than it's been in, in, in many, many years. And that's, that's why the, the respect for international law but is also, I think, for me, res- it's the way sometimes also negotiation or discussion must take place. If I take the attitude, and I'll, I'll take you, you had the example of uh, Libya in 2011, 2012, when the International Committee Security Council decided even to allow the use of force against Libya. After, that was after some declarations by the then leader, Muammar al-Gaddafi, that uh, some rebels in the eastern part in Benghazi were animals, they should be destroyed and all this. That led to out, outbursts of emotions and led uh, states to believe that there was an intervention that was needed. The Security Council passed a number of resolutions, including one that uh, under Chapter 7 that allowed the use of all necessary measure, all necessary means. To, to force Libya to comply and, and to, to stop attacking its people, it, 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 some people within Libya. And that led, and there was, it was not clear in that resolution that that also meant allowing either troops on the ground or destroying actively air defenses of Libya. That's what NATO and, and some Arab nations decided to do. And Russia and China did not forget that. Russia and China abstained on their interpretation of what the Security Council resolution actually meant. So when the Security Council who should have intervened in Syria, it couldn't because China and Russia remembered what happened in Libya. And that is really, so, so sometimes it's a way of especially powerful states, how they conduct themselves, how they, they try to get other states to respect international law, that is important. Because if it leads to hostile hostility, if it leads to, to simmering bad tensions, it can then uh, exacerbate the situation. That's very interesting. Um, you, When you said the Gaddafi thing, and now he referred to insurgents as animals and the security council yeah kind of foster resolution for any means necessary uh, the argument can be made that when a few of the israeli generals were saying the same thing about yeah. palestinian people that the same thing yeah. could have been done against israel but it wasn't mm-hmm. for and that kind yeah. of comes back into who your political exactly. allies are yeah. but, but you see in the case you, you raised it was important if you had Mem- members of the military of a nation that, that start saying that we should destroy them all, they're like animals or dogs, then the duty on the government of that state would be to take action or suppress that kind of conduct. I think where, where in my view, South Africa should have probably focused its energy in this case before the court would not be as much on genocide as the state not taking the necessary measures to prevent genocide. I know it's, it's very it's technicality, but it does change quite a bit, I would say, even the kind of evidence you have to procure in front of the court, the kind of uh, accounts that you can use. Hmm. I guess that's similar to, I guess, Murder cases and things where you mm-hmm. talk about first degree, second degree murder, and if you charge someone with first degree murder and you can't prove it, they can't be convicted for second in the same case. Another case needs to be brought up. So it's, I'm guessing it's on the similar lines. Well, I, I, it really shows how I mean, how difficult the job of ministers of foreign affairs, and especially I would say more importantly, those who work under ministers of foreign affairs. To be, they have to have an excellent knowledge of international law, but they also need to know how to 
fit that knowledge within obviously the policies of the state and that's and that can lead to results that are sometimes as i tell my students when i teach is that obviously i teach them what the law should be or is on paper but we have we cannot for, for me, international law is a discipline that can only lead to tears if you have a black and white mentality that international law exists and you have to comply with it. I think that's where international relations are a very good complement to international law because international relations forces us as international lawyers to look at what, what are the causes of conflicts? What lead the state to act in certain circumstances in this or that way? And I think that's that's it's an excellent marriage, international law, international relations, because we can then understand why sometimes a vital interest or a state's perception of an interest is that it's so crucial, so vital to the state that it means that they might, on a specific set of facts, decide that they have no other choice but to violate international law. The problem is when that violation becomes a norm rather than being an exception. I would just like to point out that we've been recording for an hour and a half, so we should probably get towards any final questions. Jeremy, did you have any? Uh, I think the the last question I have is one that you probably have too, Sahir, and that is, again, touching on Professor Costi's optimism for this situation. How Do you have any thoughts on how the, the system could be fixed because we've obviously discussed about how flawed it is do you have any sort of idea of realistically how this could be changed for the better yes yeah you should always take my predictions with a grain of salt i was uh, i always thought that the trilogy of the lord of the rings would be a big flop at the movie theaters when they came out so take take what i'm going to say with a grain of salt the 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 reality i think is that we we have to hope that all conflicts do end one day. I, when I was young, I didn't think that the the Cold War would ever end. If I look at the situation in in Gaza or in the Palestinian occupied territories, I, I, even only 15, 20 years ago, anyone coming up with the idea of a separate state or the two state solution, in many circles, we were all we would have been condemned as being pro-terrorist. Things have changed. Even the United States openly now have said there's no other way but a two-state solution in, the, in, in Palestine. I think we, we, that's, I, I like to think that it's the evolution, obviously law can only flourish if there is also political support. And I think that I know when we look at the situation right now in Ukraine, I'm quite worried about how the Ukrainian forces have limited means at their disposal. If I look at Gaza with so many displaced persons that have really nothing to do with what has happened between Hamas and the and the and the military force of Israel and that are starving, it is for me shocking to see that. I already thought that in the 1990s both in Europe and in the former Yugoslavia and in Rwanda, the genocide, it's hard to see how have we improved the society compared to what was happening 75, 80 years ago. But at the same time, I like to think it's also the reaction that is changing. Uh, in, 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 for Gaza, Western governments have not just remained silent. They have been critical of the attitude of of the forces of Israel. Israel has a right to defend itself. There is a right of self-defense, but it must be exercised within the limits imposed by the law. And that has been quite clear. 30 years ago, that would not have occurred. For Ukraine and Russia, I, it, it is perplexing to me what's that, that all the, the Western nations are doing. Yes, providing some weapons, but we leave a, a people which of a country which has a much smaller population have to defend itself against forces that are way uh, more powerful. I, I, I 
though when I say I'm a bit optimistic or that I try to be optimistic is that even the, the, I know the president Zelensky and others have said that you cannot you cannot uh, sign a peace accord you cannot stop the fighting but I just I just remind uh, our listeners that Sometimes, even after a peace agreement takes place, you can still prosecute individuals who've committed crime. The best example is in the former Yugoslavia. The Dayton Accords in 95 or 96 uh, saw, in fact, a kind of end of, of hostilities. Yet, well, um, well Milosevic, President Milosevic, Dr. Karacic were eventually, even though they were sitting at the table when these accords took place, yet were eventually prosecuted or died in, in jail before they were prosecuted. So I think that, it, that uh, it's, it's important that to see that there is always a tomorrow. Unfortunately, for those who suffer, it uh, cannot come fast enough. And it some, unfortunately, it, cannot all, it doesn't always come. But we have to believe that, that, uh, that, uh, that and I'm not here taking, uh, I'm not being paid by the New Zealand government, but I think respect, by majority of states of, of the rules-based order is the best way forward. And that is with that kind of diplomacy that we can we can make advances and also to make, make sure that uh, there are also the resources necessary in international tribunals to prosecute. If I take an example, the, the extraordinary, extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia eventually only made, I think, three trials because the process came too late. And a few states gave, gave money to this hybrid tribunal to judge Khmer Rouge perpetrators. Uh, if you look at the International Criminal Court, the, the Office of the Prosecutor works with limited resources. It's for sure that they have to decide where they put their energy, which at the moment would be probably on Ukraine. The, and if they were to decide to look into a situation in Gaza, uh, climate change will not be an, a priority. So what I so what I what I mean is that it's it's also a question of states providing the resources. And at the end of the day, it's that the young generations are the ones that can bring a change in policies of government. And and that's really. But yes, there's no magic rule. About, about that, I'm, I'm afraid. But better respect by more states is the way forward. I, I think that's a great place to end because, of course, we can. International law is just not a one hour, 30 minute su subject. It goes <laughs> way longer. And there's so many more questions, of course, we would have liked to ask and discuss. But I think this is a good place to end. And hopefully, we can get. Professor Costi back on or some of their colleagues back on later to yeah. go into more details because I look forward to the comment sections already being like, oh, you didn't go far enough about this. You didn't cover that. Oh, I would be, would be more than happy to come back. I could have spent hours. With, uh, I found it very interesting. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for giving me time to speak with, with both of you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jeremy, again for coming on. Oh, thank you both. Yeah, it's been really enlightening. Very, very interesting. This is not something that I talk about on my day to day. So it's, uh, it's a nice, refreshing change for me. Ah, that's good. Um, all right, Professor Costi, the very last thing before we say goodbye is if you had any one piece of advice for our listeners to take home, what would it be? Read widely on current events. When I say widely, various sources, not only the sources that you trust, but also sometimes looking beyond to see what is out there to be well informed. I think good information is the best way to, to build good uh, positions.